we were looking at uh, implementation of latches and flip flop. In the receiver, we need a latch to make the decision, and in both transmitter and receiver, we need uh, flip flops and latches to uh, in the deserializer, deserializer to delay the signal to increment the FIR pressure in the decision feedback equalizer. And so on. Okay. So we uh, looked at the strong arm latch in uh, some detail because it's quite popular and we can also use the flip flop. Okay. I'll just quickly outline some of the other options that uh, we have. <coughs> There's something known as current mode logic, which is based on uh, differential pairs and current switching. Uh, this typically is among the highest speed circuits you can implement in a given process, but the disadvantage is they consume a lot of uh, power. Okay. Here, uh, essentially, in a, this is usually abbreviated to CML. Just like other logic families, you can implement other logic gates. I didn't go into those things, but uh, just like you have CMOS family, you have dynamic logic, and so on, you can implement any logic gate. Similarly, here also, but I won't get into that. I'll only look at the latch part of it. So, the classic current mode logic CML latch is the following. We have a differential pair to which the input is applied. And let's assume that there is a bias current source here. Then what happens is the output voltage of the differential pair will be some amplified version of the input. Okay. Now to turn it into a latch, what is done is the following. So, this side, <coughs> this amplifier is active only when the clock is high. Okay. And there is another differential pair. Which is active when the clock is low. Okay. And this differential pair is connected up as a cross coupled pair. This, you know, again has uh, this bistable characteristic. So, if you start from some initial condition, it has positive feedback. So, it will reinforce the initial condition and uh, the difference voltage keeps on increasing until the current is completely switched to one transistor or the other. Okay. And we have the current source at the bottom. Okay. So this operation is in fact easier to understand even than the strong arm latch. When clock is high and clock bar is low, this current source is biasing the left differential pair. And essentially you have an amplifier. And then when clock goes low and clock bar becomes high, there would be some initial condition here, and then at the moment the current is switched to the right side, this regenerates from that initial condition and completely switches the current, whatever current we have here, to one side or the other. Okay. So the differential output voltages, which appear at uh, these nodes, each one will be. Will be complementary and there will be I naught R below VDD or at VDD itself. Okay. Is this fine? <clears throat> now, this can be uh, passed under some circumstances. So, first of all, these output nodes do not swing the entire rail. Okay. So, this is a low swing logic. You don't, I mean, you choose I naught R to be a few hundred millivolts. And then it switches only by that amount. And if you also ensure that these swings are about the same, okay, 
you make sure that these clock transistors also are in saturation, right, when they switch, then it can be fast, but that itself can be a bit of a drop off, okay, because the common mode required for the input and common mode required for the clock are different, but it can be arranged, okay. Now, you can also switch the clocks to full rails, in which case it goes into tryout region, so that can also work. Uh, at very low supply voltages, you don't have to do any options, but that can work as well. Okay. And there are other uh, uh, alternatives people have tried by omitting the current. Okay. So then the current is not uh, controlled at all, in that you have these on transistors and you have the resistor and the current is set based on that. Based on that. Okay. So this. has the advantage that you can have high speed, but uh, one of the disadvantages is that the swing is low. I mean, rather, this can be an advantage or a disadvantage. It's in fact fast because the swing is low, it doesn't swing the whole way. At the same time, if you want to drive something else with this, that low swing may or may not be enough. You may have to convert this to full rail logic to drive the conventional uh, logic circuit. Okay. It may need a swing converter, but the bigger disadvantage is, at least in this form, right? This always consumes current, whether there is data transmission or not. Okay, so the power displacement is very high. So that's the current mode logic. And also, you can uh, size these, uh, the differential amplifier, the input sampling transistors and the latches equally or unequally, depending on which characteristic you want to uh, optimize. If you want a small uh, clock to queue delay, maybe the sampling input can be stronger. Okay. Or, uh, yeah. Think of it. Any questions about this? Sometimes at the higher speed you use this. Uh, that is, uh, you may use the CMI latch to make the decision, or you may use it in the earlier stages of the DC analyzer. After one or two stages of this, you can go to CMI Okay. And once you go down to a certain speed, right? I didn't cover the usual static CMOS. I assume that we know from uh, we know those things from conventional digital courses. You can also, I think, you're also familiar with. Uh, Synthesis and automated layout of uh, digital systems, right? So those things use conventional static CMOS logic. Of course, their uh, speed limit is low compared to the circuits that we discussed. So once the deserialization is down to, let's say, from 10 gig, you come down to 1 gig or maybe 500. Gig. After that, probably in an advanced process, you can use the synthesis logic. Okay. No, that is the level of these. So, if let's say this is uh, VOP and VOM, if the output is high, logic high, that means that VOP will be, sorry, this is not VDD plus minus, I not right, actually, I made a mistake here. The time, the differential swing is plus minus I not R. Each one will be either VDD or VDD minus I not R. And this will be VDD minus I not R. If the output is logic high, that side will be VDD, the other side will be VDD minus I not I not R. It does in that uh, the switching is not instantaneous, in that the, between clock and clock bar, right? Uh, it's not as though this transistor turns off immediately and this turns off immediately. So it does have a sampling effect. Okay. Uh, one thing is, I mean, the two outputs are not 
well compared to strong match it may or may not be faster in a given process that we have to respect okay but the advantage may come from uh, so in a strong arm lab when it goes from reset to uh, sampling first of all both the nodes have to swing a long way down from vdd and then start regenerating here that is not done. okay so in the sampling mode right this is a you try a, you design this to be a wide bandwidth amplifier hopefully things have settled down and then after that it starts regenerating immediately okay and also in this right you can use other wide banding techniques now of course this latch becomes like uh, super heavy if it's only necessary to use it like for instance in series with r you can use an l so that uh, the parasitary capacitance here the effect of that is somewhat compensated by the l so you can make it even more broadband and so on but of course you can't have like a number of latches always there on inductor it just becomes unwieldy yeah so uh, basically the charging rate of these nodes will be i y c l now <coughs> there will be some load which is attached to this okay and there will be its own parasitic capacitance you try to minimize its own parasitic capacitance and so on so if you want a high bandwidth right you have to choose a small resistor and a large current okay and actually yeah that brings me to another point like uh, many of these advantages right that you have to simulate and try and it also depends on whether something is advantageous sometimes it depends on whether it is driving a heavy load or another phase like itself okay that is uh, if whether the load capacitance that is connected here that dominates over the internal parasitic capacitances or whether it is comparable okay so then also the trade offs will be somewhat different yeah so the which one uh <coughs> it can be faster see the one problem here is that if you operate these i mean you will operate these clocks with let's say a lower swing than a strong arm line then the overdrive for each of the transistors is also smaller so that disadvantage is there okay so that smaller swing it's an advantage of the output because it doesn't have to go all the way from vdd to ground at the same time that small swing is a disadvantage for switching transistors because if you want to switch transistors you just apply the largest voltage possible like faster transistors so that's that but there is the fact that it doesn't have to come down all the way from vdd and then start regenerating so that's the advantage one of the differential pairs yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so at the most we can go down to three video yeah that's right because i think yeah that's uh, i mean if you want to keep all transistors in saturation there is also the headroom limitation but i mean in a cmos case actually you could probably let some of them enter prior region it will be okay see this thing the historically this thing came from bipolar uh, transistor you may have heard of something called emitter coupled logic i don't know how to put it ttl and all those things and emitter coupled logic now in bipolar transistors right you should not enter the saturation region at all that is the bipolar saturation region where the vc is small in a mos case nothing bad happens i mean the gm becomes small whereas in a bipolar case if vce becomes small then it uh, becomes extremely slow right because of the slow charge in the base low beta all those things and it just terrible so in a bipolar case it's much more crucial to keep it in active region so that's why this current steering logic with low swings which will make sure that all the transistors are in the uh, high vce region 
that is uh, like much faster than any other type of logic in which the transistor saturates. In TTL and so on, I think there are some transistors which saturate. That is, they they'll have a lot of base current and the collector emitter voltage goes down to very small values. Whereas uh, in a MOS case, it's not as though, I mean, when VDS becomes small, it does start drawing base current and stuff like that. That is not there. Okay. So you can let it go a little bit into triode region. And that's why in the MOS case, this, uh, the difference between this and other uh, logic families may not be that much. Okay. Especially, I mean, there is always a problem when we have a low supply voltage. If you stack these transistors, you have like a small headroom and so on. Still, this current steering process has some advantages, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, has some advantages in speed compared to full rail switching. But still, uh, you have to evaluate different alternatives before you fix it because the price that you pay is very high cost. And the other thing is even if the latch itself operates at a higher speed, you may have to take this uh, low swing logic and for further use, let's say in the DC realizer, you have to convert it to a full rail logic to drive other theme of <coughs> But as usual, what you do is uh, you simulate and evaluate. I mean, in a serial link, you have uh, low speeds and the parallel data input and output. And then it becomes high speed in the middle. So you see at which stage, like what has to be used, obviously. Right? We use this only for the highest speed. Any other questions? So that's what, that's why I said. Whether we are looking at a scenario where it is driving its own parasitics, or I mean, where parasitic, whether parasitic scale with uh, the device size, right? So, in general, this is true of any circuit. So, so let's say this has a current I. This may not even be a bias current, it's just a current that is consumed. You have a number of stages. You have internet connect gap. You may have like external load and so on. Okay. So typically, let's say this has a certain current I and it has a certain speed. Okay. So if you put two of these circuits in parallel, that is, you connect the corresponding nodes together. This is basically like doubling the width of all transistors, making all the resistors half and so on. So what happens is. All the transistor sizes and all the parasitic within the circuit will scale. Okay. But if this capacitance is dominant, then you have higher current for the same capacitance. So it will increase the speed. Now, as you keep on doing this, as you go on increasing the uh, scaling of the circuit, increasing the size and the current, I mean, it's not as though you can increase the size of transistors without adding other, I mean, extra parasitic capacity. I mean, you don't merely double because the size itself increases. You also have other overheads in the interconnect. At some point, the uh, scaling of the circuit, I mean, the circuit parasitics will start becoming dominant. At this point, if you double the current and double the width, you end up with the same I by T and it doesn't increase anymore. Okay? So that's how, I mean, in a given process, you will end up with uh, some limit on the speed. Okay? So as you go to higher speed, you should try to have smaller MOS devices. And uh, so that you have small parasites. Okay, so which means that you have to operate them with a high current density. That is, per unit width, you should have a lot of current. Okay, for a given width, you will have some capacitance, and then uh, that capacitance has to be charged with a large current. So essentially, you should operate with a large VDS on the field. Now, if you think of uh, it in analog terms, you know that the FT of a transistor, the transit frequency, is proportional to VGS minus VT by L square. You obviously operate with the minimum length and the highest VGS minus VT that's possible. So from this point of view, you can see having low swing is a disadvantage because now you are, uh, uh, <coughs> you have a controlled low swing, but that also gives you 
like a smaller roll drive for a transistor and lesser capacitor. But if it is operating in the current steering mode, that is, the difference voltage here required is small. Okay. Okay, that's related to, again, I mean, it is related to VGS minus VT. For the, that to be small, the VGS minus VT also has to be small. But it operates in a uh, symmetric way. Any other questions? Yeah. Now, uh, I'll quickly go through like some flip flops which are uh, used at high speeds. Again, there is a static CMOS flip flop that I assume you know and I won't deal with that. There is a family of uh, circuits known as TSTC or true single phase clock logic. Again, you can make any logic gate with this, but I'll only look at just a latch and a flip-flop, okay? Now, now this flip-flop is different in that it doesn't have any regeneration at all, okay? It just has some gain and the small swing will become bigger swing because of gain. But a regeneration stuff is different. I mean, if you leave it enough time, anything will regenerate to the full rate. That doesn't happen. Basically, the basic block is extremely simple. We have the CMOS inverter. In this case, I am only talking about latches and flip flops. So, if I give A, I get out A bar. That's all. Okay. But what I want to do now is latch it. That is, latching means, I mean, there has to be a clock, and in one phase of the clock, it should work as a logic gate. In another uh, phase of the clock, it should not respond to the that's the last bit. So that is quite simple in that I can break this uh, branch and then insert a clock. Okay. Now clearly, if clock is high, okay, and if clock is low, why? I'll say it doesn't change. Okay, this has to be qualified a little bit, but this is like those dynamic logic circuits. What happens is that when clock is high, I mean, you just have two transistors in series at the bottom, okay? It's just like a regular inverter. When clock is low, if A was low, then the upper transistor will be on and will make Y equal to 1, okay? So, if A was low before and then clock became low, Y will be at 1, okay? Now, when A, if A is high, when the clock was high, Y will be at 0. When clock becomes low, Y is actually floating because this side is off and that side is also off. But we expect that the parasitic capacitor will hold its value. Okay. So in this case, uh, when clock is 0, Y equal to 1 is actually actively pulled up. Okay. And Y equal to 0, it is just dependent on Parasitic cap. Okay. This fine. And actually, it doesn't even, I mean, it's not true that Y doesn't change. Meaning, if uh, let's say A was 0 originally in the when uh, clock is 1, then Y will be 1. Then let's say clock becomes 0, Y will remain at 1. Then, if A becomes 0, there is no pull down, so Y doesn't change. So, it actually only holds a high state, okay? But then, if A was originally 0 and it became 1, this CMOS transistor will turn on and then will uh, pull up Y, okay? So, this is just a partial latch at this point. 
So to By the way, I mean, there is the opposite polarity counterpart, which is you take this, then you have a PMOS. This way, basically, the clock phase is reversed, right? This is clock in this case, whatever was happening with clock equal to one here will happen. So now, to make this work properly, for a single state, what happens is, clock is 1, y equal to a bar, this is clear, when clock is 0, only I'll say that it basically works only for uh, high output, right? If y was high, when clock becomes zero, things will be fine. But if y was low, then it can be disturbed. Okay. So how do you fix it? You just put one more inverter. The same stuff. This is Z. Okay. Now you can see that the first stage works properly when uh, Y is high. Okay. Or basically Z is 0. And the second stage works properly when Z is high. Meaning it doesn't let any input through when Z was high. So it actually works for both Z equal to 1 and 0. With two stages. Okay. So essentially in a latch, what you want is when clock is low, the input changes should not affect the output. Okay. So in this case, what happens is that when clock is low, if Y was uh, originally low, that is A was high, then Z will be high. Then if uh, <coughs> A changes, right, if A becomes 0 and then Y becomes 1, this still doesn't change. Z doesn't change. Okay. So basically with two stages, it works. So similarly, for the opposite polarity, you need two stages. Okay. This is basically this latch holds when clock is zero, and this holds when clock is one. Again, the advantage of these things compared to some other uh, uh, static theme of latches and so on is that there is a single phase clock. Okay? And in fact, instead of uh, just these single transistors, you can have complicated logic. Like, for instance, you can have parallel MOSFETs here and series MOSFETs here to implement AND gates and so on. I think you're probably familiar with this domain, I mean, this uh, dynamic logic circuit where Essentially, the propagation is inhibited by some clock, but uh, the pull-up and pull-down branches can have all kinds of logic. In our case, we are only looking at latches. Okay, so this can be used, but the, this latch does not have regeneration. Okay, that's a disadvantage. This is fine. Now, how do you make a flip-flop out of this? You can do that, but uh, basically you can basically put uh, the, this latch and that latch together, right? Essentially, to make a flip-flop, you need a latch 
which passes data in the high phase of the block, followed by a lag, which passes data in the low phase. So there is a sort of sampling at the edge. Okay, but there is a more optimum thing that is used. Essentially, the idea is to avoid, uh, I mean, or reduce the number of matches. So this is a latch that is active at the, I mean, that passes data in the high phase of this block. I mean, this is a rather, this is a half life sort of, it doesn't completely work. The three more stars, I guess. Now, this is a latch that uh, passes data in the low phase of the clock. Okay. So I could try cascading this. Again, the problem is the same thing, right? Because the, at the output of the first one, if y was 1, things are OK. But if y is 0, actually things are floating and then it's not actively held, OK? So now, uh, that's the reason why we introduced the second branch here. But uh, the optimization I'm talking about is if I put this and that together, I'll have four essentially a cascade of four stages and it can be further optimized by doing this. So you can just have three stages instead. Let me see if I got the phrasing correct. Say this works properly. When clock is high, A goes to Y. Okay. And this node this is equal to zero. Okay. And when clock is high, anyway, this the second, I mean the last stage doesn't pass the output. Alright. And when clock becomes zero. Okay, so if this y was 1, okay, so this was pulled to 0 and then this is off and it remains that way, okay. But if y is 0, then this gets pulled to high and then the output will change the state, okay. So with the three branches, you can get a, the equivalent of a flip flop. But with all this dynamic logic stuff, you have to be careful uh, in a couple of uh, things. First, this has to, these have to operate periodically uh, with a clock above a certain frequency. Okay. So, whereas the static uh, flip clock, right, the clock doesn't have to be periodic and it can come. I mean, you can have an edge, uh, like let's say every microsecond, and maybe you can have the next edge tomorrow and it will still work. Because it, will, it has the active regeneration state, which will hold it. Here, uh, between, I mean, in some cases, the nodes are floating and the voltage is just held because of on the parasitic capacitor. But it will start leaking because of all the diodes and other leakage parts from that node. So this will not work below a certain frequency. Okay. There is a minimum frequency limit. On top of it, you will have 
The other problem is, so let's say when clock becomes uh, high, or when uh, some uh, transistor becomes high and it connects two nodes, each one has a parasitic capacitor. So let's say this was holding some state. Okay, there'll be charge sharing between those two nodes and so on. So the actual values will not be at VDD or zero because there is no regeneration. Uh, if because of charge sharing, if it reduces from VDD, it will remain at the smaller VDD. So you will have the charge sharing issues which you have to take care of. And also while doing layout, you have to do it carefully so that uh, these floating nodes, right, by uh, definition, they are very sensitive. Any coupling to them will change their voltage and then there is nothing restoring them. Okay. So you have to make sure that the coupling to those things are minimal. Any questions about this? But this true single phase lag was actually an uh, important innovation in digital logic stuff because it was a single phase clock. People were able to make very high speed stuff. There used to be a company, I think no longer exists, Tech. Uh, they used to make these watch stations and they made these microprocessors for very, very fast. Any questions about this? Why? Why? What is the question? When this one. Yeah. So, first, when uh, clock is high, right? So, why can be driven to either high or low? When clock is high, I mean, why can we pull low and can we pull high? Now, uh, when clock becomes low, if A was uh, 0, this will be held high. But if A is uh, 1, it is just floating. So, what is the question now? Because, uh, uh, no, no, I mean, it's uh, 3 that are working together. Yeah, if A becomes 0, when? Clock is 0, you mean. Yeah. So, when A becomes uh, 0, when clock is 0, so let's see. Did I make a mistake in the phasing? Y will go up. Yeah, that is okay. So, what is the issue? It won't change. I mean, this node should not change, right? For the output node to change. Yeah, so the second stage will prevent uh, passing. So, okay, that pretty much finishes what I had wanted to discuss. Uh, I only looked at, I only discussed binary data transmission. Now, uh, multi-level data transmission is of course possible, and in uh, wireless communication and so on, you have like very complicated constellations, right? You have constellations with 64 points or maybe even 1024 points and things like that. In high-speed serial link, you cannot use that, okay? Basically, because the, for a given swing, the distance between symbols becomes smaller and smaller, and you can't use that. But one particular thing that is used is Pam four. So essentially, so let's say I'll show like a two bit. These are two bit intervals and each one can be either 
plus or minus 1. Okay, so this is with binary data transfer. So, in a 2 bit interval, there are 4 possibilities minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1, and 1, 1. Okay, there are essentially 4 symbols. Now, instead of uh, transmitting a signal like this, one could transmit. A single four level symbol. Okay, so let me call it simply 0, 1, 2, or 3. That is what we will be transmitting. Uh, so you transmit either so the eye diagram would look like that. Okay, I transmit either of this, maybe I will call this minus 3, minus 1, 1, and 3. Okay. That is, instead of transmitting either plus or minus 1 in an interval, every TV I change this value. Okay. Instead, I transmit one of these four possible values minus 3, minus 1, 1, 3. Okay. So perhaps this uh, minus 3 corresponds to having two consecutive minus 1. And minus 1 is minus 1, 0. 1 is Oh, sorry, minus 1 plus 1 and then this is 1 and minus 1 and 3 is 1 and 1, okay. So, you have exactly the same information here as here, okay, except the transitions are happening every 2 TV. So, what is the effect on the signal? Bandwidth is half basically because the symbol rate is half, the spectrum of this Rectangular, if it is rectangular data, so that is where it will have the null, whereas this is f, this is the spectral density, this is where it will have the first null, okay. So, clearly the signal bandwidth is half. So, that is a great advantage, right, because actually the attenuation of a transmission line goes up drastically with frequency. So, having a half uh, signal, I mean half of the signal bandwidth is a great advantage, okay. What is the disadvantage? Huh? So, first there are more voltage levels to generate and decode, that is a problem. In this case, uh, in the case of binary this one, right? We just need one last, one comparator to distinguish between plus one and minus one. How many do we need in this case? How many do we need to distinguish between these four levels? Huh? Three. Yeah. Basically, we need a two-bit A to D converter with thresholds there, there, and there, so that we can distinguish between the four levels. Okay. So, that is there. Then, what else? So, this certainly involves then another important thing. Actually, at this point, it is still probably worthwhile, okay, you have a more complicated receiver, but half the bandwidth this is a huge advantage, okay. But the main problem is the following, I mean, in a transmitter, this value is voltage limited, okay. The way I have drawn it, uh, this is 3 and this is 1, but you can't do that, okay. So, maybe this whole thing is just 1 volt and this whole thing is also 1 volt, this is of course not to scale. So, now, the distance between these two will be one third of a volt. Okay, so that means that uh, essentially your latch has to be has to now resolve a value that is one third of uh, what was earlier. So that's a big signal to noise ratio disadvantage, right? That's 9 dB. So that's why, although this looks attractive because your volt is limited, uh, this has this problem. Okay, so you have to see now. Roughly speaking, like I said, uh, you will look at the attenuation at half the symbol rate. 
to judge what a channel is doing, right? Here it is the symbol. Have the symbol there. Now let's say the channel response is something like this. Okay. Now you have some attenuation here, and you have a larger attenuation here. Now, roughly speaking, if this attenuation is so high that it makes up for this one third disadvantage, it's worthwhile going to PAM4. Okay. But if this attenuation is not so high, then actually, yes, you have less attenuation at a lower data rate. At the same time, you have smaller signal to begin with. So it doesn't have any advantage. Okay. So for a long time, it was this puzzle like whether to use PAM4 or not PAM4, not use PAM4, because the binary the receiver is simpler, everything becomes a lot nicer. But if you go to a scenario where the attenuation becomes unbearable, or the, uh, uh, so then you will have to go to PAM4. Okay? So up to 10 gigabits per second and so on, typically it's all binary. But now that we have this 56 gigabit per second uh, data uh, streams, people are going to PAM4 because uh, now the data rate is so high that this uh, reduction in bandwidth uh, gives you so like an advantage which outweighs the other disadvantages. Fine. Okay, so with that we come to the end of the course. I'll have a, a small assignment, but this will be mostly this MATLAB type stuff to uh, simulate eye diagrams and so on and plot it. And we'll have the exam and whenever it is uh, scheduled. So don't worry too much about the exam. It will be a simple exam. What I'm planning to do is have an exam and after that have a viva based on what you have. So that way, even if you do something, you have okay. Now, uh, the exam is in the afternoon, right? For you, it will be usually scheduled in the afternoon. Can we have it in the morning? Which day is it, do you know? Fourth, third, okay. Okay, that, uh, the exam scheduling part, I'll send you uh, an email if uh, necessary, if I'm going to change anything. Otherwise, we'll have a short exam for the exam.